How you doing there, folks? Laban Shmuel here, coming to you from FEMA region number three. Watch for that face, Laban. Looks like somebody just poked you in the hoo-ha with a hot pancake flipper. Well, let me tell you, Shirley's been at me. You know why? It's this space. This space right here. That's bothering her. Yeah. We got guys out there dressing up like Uncle Milty, trying to get into the little girl's room, and Shirley's worried about this space. Hmm. I says to her, Shirley, what do you want I should do? Get a big Sharpie and color it in like Groucho Marx? Yeah, there you go. That'll do it. Now I look like Hitler with handlebars. I give vault. Get that off of there. Put some elbow grease. I ain't gonna break. Thank you very much. I told Shirley if I am to alter the facial hair in any way, shape, or form, that is in the hands of Elohim. But for right now, we gotta talk about this. Why, Laden? Why is this a prophecy alert? Now, you know what? Let me tell you what. It shouldn't be. Everything. That's right. Everything that I'm about to address in this here video should be. That's right. Should be. Stuff that you should have no concern about. If one is thoroughly. And yes, in light of the perilous times that we are presently living, it must be thoroughly. If one is thoroughly grounded in the living word of Elohim. If your house is built on the rock and not on the sand. What I am going to speak about should be of no consequence to you at all. But alas, oh alas, so many who claim salvation through Yeshua HaMashiach are simply not, not, not reading their scriptures. They are more interested in watching hyped up news stories uh, turned into signs, for Pete's sake. And then you got this Mandela effect. You're not going to read your scriptures because of the Mandela effect. Are you kidding me? This is a trick. This is a trick of the world. Oh, <laughs> when you see this stuff, if you're grounded in the word, you will immediately think of what Yeshua said in Matthew, Matthew, who chapter 24, verse 4. Look closely at those words and take them into your heart, my friends. Oh, read them with me. And Yeshua answering said to them, Take heed that no one leads you astray. And this stuff is about as astray as you can get. How can you fall for this? That is, of course, if you're grounded in the word, how can you fall for this? I'm not talking about the lost people. I'm, ta I'm preaching to the choir now here. Yeah. And you know what? Let me tell you what. Too many people in the choir can't carry a tune. As a matter of fact, there's a lot of people just moving their lips. No notes at all coming out. Trees are known by the fruit. Mandela effect. You know what I thought that thing was when I first heard about it? I thought it's when somebody shows up at your funeral and does gibberish sign language. <laughs> Remember that? Remember when that fruitcake got up at Nelson Mandela's funeral and gibbered with his hands? <laughs> I thought that was the Mandela effect, yeah. But uh, like uh, Pastor J.D. says, keep that in your hip pocket. I think I'll have something to say about this Mandela effect a bit later. Now, what was I saying? Oh, yeah, people are not reading their Bibles, and they are listening to those who falsely, falsely divide the word of Elohim. And then they want to know, oh, why do I always feel so bad? Why do I not have joy and peace? Well, let me tell you why they don't have joy and peace. Let me tell you why they feel bad all the time. Because they're more interested in watching a DVD about giants or where to buy precious metals for when the Antichrist comes to steal their paper money. They put their Bibles away, make some popcorn, then sit down and watch about a guy digging up big toes the size of bocce balls in Guadalajara. Come on now, I'm not putting people down to go out and do that stuff, but what bearing does an 11-foot shin bone have on your redemption drawing nigh? None. But Laban, it shows that we're closer to the rapture. No, it doesn't. Aquila and Priscilla thought the rapture was going to happen 2,000 years ago. Come on now, we know there were giants. What's that got to do with comforting one another with the words that the bridegroom is coming? People, if your blessed hope is for Yeshua to take you in the twinkling of an eye to his father's house, there is no reason to be watching Jack and the Beanstalk. Jack and the Beanstalk? What are you talking about, Leben? Let me tell you what I'm talking about, Leben. There are too many brothers and sisters out there, those who claim to be followers of Yeshua, who are trying to be like Jack and climb the beanstalk, relying on your own strength and works to gain material things and secure your own safety. You are to rely strictly on Elohim, and we're going to get into that, though, believe you me. 
Oh, my friends, don't you understand? When the bridegroom arrives, he will be looking for those who have sought to fill their lamps with oil, not those who are searching for geese that can lay golden eggs. So there you go, there's your Jack and the Beanstalk. Oh, 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 how can you ask Elohim why your days are filled with apprehension, anxiety, and outright fear? Then you'd rather fill your minds with this. Your scriptures are sitting up on a shelf, and you're looking at this. Then you see a plaque hanging on your wall that reads this. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And you think... Why do I not have this rest? Oh, dear brother, dear sister, put away these fables, these foolish, hyped-up lies from the mouth of a defeated enemy, and fill your hearts and your minds with that which will fulfill the scripture, and fulfill it beyond your wildest imaginations. <laughs> Take a look at what the Apostle Paul wrote in this wonderful passage here. From his letter to the Philippians, chapter 4, verse 8, Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Oh, ho. Oh. Now, I don't know whether Paul went ho, oh, oh, ho at the end of that uh, when he wrote that. But that's how I feel. Oh, my goodness, my friends, look at that. And then look at this. Do you see anything there that is noble, just, pure, lovely, virtuous, or praiseworthy? Eh? No, of course not. And the sad thing is, <laughs> and the true sign of the times, is that I even got to ask such a question. Oh, my dear friends, I can hear some of you. You're asking, you're saying, Lame. oh, how can we think on these things? It is getting harder and harder to find things like this to think about in this world, the things that Paul wrote about in his letter to the Philippians. <laughs> but there's your problem right there. You're not going to find the things that Paul is telling you to think about in this world. But they are still to be found. <laughs> not for much longer, but they are still to be found. Where, Laban? Where can we find them? <laughs> Where? Right here. Right at your fingertips. You just got to keep it in your hands. Let's go back to the passage. What, may I ask, do you think is the key word? In this passage, my friends, me, what word do I think stands out here? I think it's this word here. Finally. Do you see what Paul is telling you to do? Well, what does finally mean? It means finally. <laughs> Boy, that's profound. Then all things are said and done. And even today, at the end of the completely horrible, rotten day you had just today, your final, final thoughts of that day are to be on these things. This is how you attain the rest at the end of that bad day. Elohim forbid that the last thing you do before you lay your head down on your pillow is watch an Illuminati video. No, you are to take these things with you to your bed and you will have rest. Rest will not come when you when you dwell on what so-called watchmen attempt to fill your minds with. Yes, we are to know what's going on in these quote-unquote headlines that they post. But by the end of your day, finally, finally, as the Apostle Paul puts it, we are to think on these things, not those shame. Shame on those ear ticklers, those who post these tabloid prophecies. That's what I call them, tabloid prophecies. And they're trying to pass them off, these hyped-up news stories as signs from the Almighty of hosts. You know who you are, and mark my words, it will not stand. These ear ticklers... They are taking advantage, taking advantage of those who may not be fully mature in the faith. 
and they rob these precious children of Elohim of their peace of mind with words that are intended to catch eyes and not comfort souls. And then when these young children in Elohim discover that what they thought was truth is a lie, they become angry and even worse, discouraged. And what did our Savior say about this, my friends? But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. Read that, all you ear ticklers. Oh, Laban, you're sounding so harsh, oh, so judgmental. Well, let us consider another passage of scripture from the Apostle Paul. How about this one right here? From Romans chapter 14, verse 13. Therefore, let us not judge one another any more, but rather resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in our brother's way. My friends, there would be no need for the judgment of this type if these ear ticklers were not placing stumbling blocks in our brother's way. You understand what I'm saying? You get what I'm getting at? Every time one of these ear ticklers post what they deem to be a sign from Yahweh of hosts, which is later found to be a trivial piece of nothing. Five puffs of smoke popped out of a volcano somewhere. They sow confusion. That is what they do. They sow confusion. And who is the author of confusion? The father of Yeshua or the father of lies? Every time they do this, they degrade the credibility of when true signs occur. And oh, the words they will hear after they cry out, But Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? <laughs> but Laban, perhaps these watchmen have good intentions or are free in their consciences to uh, post this stuff. Well, then, if they were responsible ministers of the gospel of truth, they would listen again to what the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 8, verse 9. But beware, lest somehow this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to those who are weak. Friends, with every minute that passes, a little bit more of what is truly real fades away. I just mentioned the fact that the things that the Apostle Paul wrote about in his letter to the Philippians, those noble and wonderful things, they can still be found. Well, there was a time when I was a bit puzzled by this passage of scripture here. Isaiah, Yeshayahu, 55 verse 6, Seek Yahweh while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. I used to think, he is God. How can this be? Where is there that he cannot be found? He is everywhere. And what about that psalm? You know, this one right here? Read it with me, my friends. The 139th psalm, a psalm of David, verses 7 through 12. Where can I go from your ruach, your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into the Shamaim, you are there. If I make my bed in the grave, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall fall on me, even the night shall be light about me. Indeed, the darkness shall not hide from you, but the night shines as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to you. There you go. In light of that, where is it that the God cannot be found? I used to ask that question. It was not until I grew grounded in the living word of Elohim that I understood and was puzzled no longer. It wasn't until I knew the absolute truth of his promise to take his true flock away from here before these evil things really start hitting down on this earth that caused my perplexity over that scripture to vanish. Brothers and sisters, I believe that I am safe in saying that many, many who claim salvation in Yeshua do not realize that a time is coming when Yahweh will not be found. Once he takes the Ruach out of the way, 
He will not be found. Why do you think he put that in the scriptures? Seek him while he can still be found. Come on now. There is so much that is literally going to disappear when the time of Jacob's trouble begins. And it will not be just the bride, people. It won't be just the salt and the light that will disappear. Many of the things that you take for granted will be gone. Do you realize that in a very short time... These passages of scripture will be fulfilled. Isaiah 13.10 For the stars of heaven and their constellations will not give their light. The sun will be darkened in its going forth, and the moon will not cause its light to shine. Ezekiel 32.7 Then I put out your light, I will cover the heavens and make its stars dark. I will cover the sun with a cloud, and the moon shall not give her light. The prophet Joel, chapter 3, verse 15, the sun and moon will grow dark, and the stars will diminish their brightness. And then, when the fourth trumpet is sounded in Revelation, chapter 8, verse 12, then the fourth angel sounded, and a third of the sun was struck, a third of the moon, and a third of the stars so that a third of them were darkened, a third of the day did not shine, and likewise the night. Do you get it, all of you who are looking down into a phone? The light of the very stars will vanish. But how many of those who claim to be followers of the very creator of those stars go out to marvel at the perfect reality of them? There is something out there right now, my friends. I look at it every night. You see, I don't own a smartphone I gaze down on. I have a shamayim to look up into. <laughs> and every night I go out and I see this. Jupiter, the king of the wandering stars, working its way from the constellation Leo, the lion of the tribe of Judah, to Virgo, Red Mars, representative of war, working its way from the constellation Scorpio into the balances, the constellation of Libra. And almost equidistant, smack that! Between the two is the star Spica in Virgo, Spica that represents the Church of Yeshua. And high above them all, the bright Arcturus. Notice, if you will, the formation they make. Looks like a pyramid to me. The evil pyramid, hmm? Who, pray tell, do you suppose formulated the thought to create geometric shapes? Pyramids included. Hmm. Who do you suppose conjured up this evil shape, this pyramid, hmm? Satan? Or perhaps a bunch of nincompoops in lodges wearing aprons? Maybe that's it. Maybe it was created by them. Or what about him? Alistair Crowley. Ah, that has to be it. Look at the picture. He's got a pyramid right there on his head with an eye in it. Oh, my. He must have had something to do with it. Now, let me tell you what I think. Let me tell you what I see when I look up and I see that pyramid. I see these words from the Elohim of my deliverance. Read them. Read them now with me. The Shamaim declares the glory of Elohim, and the firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day are speech, and night unto night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line goes out through all the earth and their verge to the end of the world. For I see your Shamayim, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have established, the moon and stars to rule by night, for his mercy endures forever. He counts the number of the stars, he calls them all by name. Praise him, sun and moon, praise him, all you stars of light. And then there are these words as well. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with Elohim, and the Word was Elohim. He was in the beginning with Elohim. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. All things, everything, 
was made by Yeshua, who is our Elohim. And you know what? Let me tell you what. That includes pyramids. And when you fill your hearts and minds and eyes with this, instead of these words, you take the glory from the Lamb of Yahweh who took away your sin and you give it to this filth. Please, please stop listening to this trash and those who throw it at you. And heed this. And this immense pyramid in the Shamaim. Why would he put it up there for all to see if it was evil? Throw these phones as far away from you as you can and look up at reality. The reality of the stars in the Shamaim. While you still can. I am speaking now to all of you who are gathering survival gear into your barns instead of filling oil into your lamps. Those of you who mock his coming in the clouds before the time of Jacob's trouble, look up now and see the reality of those stars, not the falsity of your headlines and the lunacy of those who are trying to get you to focus on fables. And the Ruach is taken out of the way. The light of the stars will vanish. Then it will be futile for you to look up. But hey, why should you look up anyway, right? When you can descend into your safety bunkers and look down into your phones. Oh, the things, the things that, that those who claim salvation in Yeshua are believing. Listening to the ear ticklers instead of looking into their scriptures for the truth. We who are waiting for the bridegroom, we cry out, Maranatha, come quickly, Yeshua. But they, they are crying out for Antichrist because Yeshua isn't allowed to even come until Antichrist is revealed. Oh my goodness, the Apostle Paul would have been out of his mind to tell Aquila and Priscilla and all the first century saints such a thing. Just imagine the Apostle Paul writing such a thing to the saints at Rome. Saints, do not expect Yeshua to take you up, because the Antichrist must come first to hunt you down. Comfort one another with those words. Are you kidding me? What a blasphemous lie from the pit of hell. But of course we... We who have placed all our faith and trust in the one who cried from the tree it is finished. We're the deceivers, right? We're the liars. We're the fools because we will not be prepared with survival gear when the Antichrist arrives. But rejoice, my pre-tribulation believing brothers and sisters, to be fools for Yeshua. <laughs> Taking his commands in Matthew chapter 6 to heart and not being as those who deviously use the plight of today's Christian martyrs to further their propaganda. What are you talking about, Laban? What are you talking about? Well, let me tell you what I'm talking about. What do we consistently hear in their mocking of Yeshua's coming in the clouds? They ask, who are you to escape? Are you better than our Christian brothers and sisters in the Middle East who are losing their lives in the name of Yeshua? Well, here's a question for you. You are constantly shoving this in our faces, that, that these people over there, they're in tribulation now. Well, then why aren't you taking the food that you're storing up over to them now, huh? You are constantly justifying your prepping by saying that the reason you are doing all of this is to help people in tribulation. Well, how much of what you have stored up did you take over there for those people before they were martyred? There's a question for you. You who say Yeshua wasn't coming for them, did you know that all along? If you knew that all along, that no, Yeshua was coming to save them, why didn't you go over there and teach them how to be preppers, huh? Maybe those people over there would have lived if you had done that. If you had gone over there and taught them how to dig a bunker and hide potted meat on shelves. Maybe you're not so certain that the Antichrist is coming before the rapture. It's either that, or you just want to keep the stuff for yourselves. You say that the early church never, never taught a pre-tribulation rapture, that it is a recent teaching. So, if these dear brothers and sisters that you love to use to bolster sales for freeze-dried survival food, if they in fact did believe, 
that Yeshua would comfort them, and you didn't warn them that they were deluded fools for thinking such a thing, for thinking that Yeshua meant it when he said it is finished from the cross, then their blood is on your hands. If you knew all along that Yeshua was not coming for them, and you did not teach them how to properly prepare, then their blood is on your hands. And then, oh my goodness, what are we to say of the Apostle Peter and Paul and John, Johanan and James and all the early church fathers? Did they know? Did they know too that Yeshua was not coming before the, the great time of Jacob's trouble? If they allowed so many of Elohim's little ones to go to such horrific, tortuous deaths, what are we to think of them? I, I just wonder... If Peter and Paul and James and John, I wonder if they were as astute as today's mid- and post-tribulation teachers, in that they knew that the pre-tribulation rapture was a lie. If Peter and Paul knew that the pre-tribulation rapture was a lie and didn't warn the people, oh, what neglect, what neglect, and it would just go to show that that these apostles could not possibly be nearly as astute as the preppers of today. And of course, those great entrepreneurs who, who have made their fortunes on selling survival gear. Why did they not give a warning so that all of those who gave their lives for Yeshua might have lived? If these apostles would have taught them how to prepare, they may have lived, right? I mean, come on now. Paul wrote 14 letters, John wrote 3, Peter wrote 2, and James and Jude wrote one apiece. And you mean to tell me that not one of them, not one of these men had enough discernment to warn the church to prepare for the coming persecution by stocking up on weapons and supplies? Not one. 21 letters of instruction written by these men and not a sentence about how to prep for survival. How do you explain that? How do you explain that, preppers? The utter neglect of these men. Men who, like Peter and John, were right there with Yeshua in the inner circle. How could they not warn the people? Is the blood of all those who were martyred in the first century on their hands? Oh, if only those dear brothers and sisters who lost their lives over the last few years in the Middle East, if they had only seen this... They may have lived. You chocolate lovers will love this anyway. Tuscan butter noodles. Yummy, yummy, yummy. The Italian tomato pasta for you Italian lovers. The no-bake cookies. These are yummy. The brownies are so... They're chewy. They're moist. They're delicious. Oh, if Peter and Paul had only taught them how to prep. Do you see how silly this is, people? How utterly stupid that sounds? Not only that, it's blasphemous, blasphemous. The reason that the early church fathers didn't teach them people how to prep is because they were waiting for Yeshua to come for them in the clouds to take them to the place that he promised to take them to. They knew that they would not be part of the time of Jacob's trouble. They were not looking for the Antichrist. They were looking for their savior, for their bridegroom. That's right. How do you explain that, preppers? 21 letters of doctrine given by these men and not one sentence about digging a hole to hide in and making sure their bellies will be full when adversity comes. And say, Mr. Jim Baker and Mr. John Shorey, why did you not offer the Tuscan noodles and the brownies, huh? To your Middle Eastern brothers and sisters who are starving, huh? Why didn't you offer that to them? Why? Because you knew they didn't have the money to buy it. Why did you not rebuke them for not prepping? The way that you mock and ridicule we here who rely strictly on Yeshua for our safety. And let me ask you another. Why did they not know to prep on their own? It's only common sense, right? If they thought that the pre-tribulation rapture was a lie from hell, why didn't they start prepping? You had enough sense to start digging your hole, why didn't they? Friends, let me tell you why these Middle Eastern martyrs were not hoarding food and collecting guns. They were not doing that because they were grounded and secure in this. That's right, that. That what you're seeing right there on the screen. That was their survival gear. That was their food, and that was their drink. 
They were listening to lies. They were reading and believing the living word of Elohim. These words right here, words that the Apostle Paul could have meant precisely for them in their persecution over there in the Middle East over these last few years. They took it as if Paul was addressing them directly and telling them, that no one should be shaken by these afflictions, for you yourselves know that we are appointed to this. For in fact, we told you before when we were with you that we would suffer tribulation, just as it happened, and you know. You see, my friends, these Christian martyrs in the Middle East, they knew that Paul was talking about suffering for Yeshua. He wasn't talking about the time of Jacob's trouble. While these dear ones were suffering, they had a perfect understanding of Second Corinthians 12, verses 9 and 10. And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly I will rather boast in my infirmities, that the power of Mashiach may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses, for Mashiach's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Those Christian martyrs in the Middle East, they understood that perfectly. That's why they didn't need weapons and, and potted meat. It was the Savior himself that told the Apostle Paul, My grace is sufficient for you. But hey, preppers, just think. If the Apostle Paul had had a stockpile of weapons and a barn full of bananas, he would not have had to even bother to write that passage, right? <laughs> oh, that is infuriating. Do you see? Do you see the blasphemy? And stop it. Stop using the deaths of martyrs to promote your agenda and to profit financially from those who are not very strong in their faith. Shame on you. Those dear Christian martyrs in the Middle East, they did not need what you wouldn't even try to sell them, in that you knew they could not have afforded it. They did not need your merchandise and your promise of no Yeshua. They had this. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with Elohim through our Adon, Yeshua HaMashiach through whom also we have access by faith into his grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of Elohim. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope. Now hope does not disappoint, because the love of Elohim has been poured out in our hearts by the Ruach HaKadosh, who was given to us. Oh, oh, you see, my brothers and sisters, we do not have to lament over those dear martyrs in the Middle East. Oh, no, for they had the Ruach HaKadosh, and they understood that perfectly. But preppers, don't feel bad. You're, you're going to have brownies. Do you see and understand, my friends, why these dear martyrs did not have to store up guns and food? You see, they knew. They knew and they believed the scriptures when they taught that character and hope are attained by sharing in the suffering of their Savior, not by making sure that their bellies would be full when the, when the persecution arrived. And now, consider the letters from Yeshua himself to the seven churches in Revelation chapters 2 and 3. Where, where in these letters does he nullify the entirety of Matthew chapter 6 and command the people to prepare to take up arms against the Antichrist? Why to the church of Smyrna does he write this? I know your works and tribulation and poverty, but why, why did Yeshua not be straight with this church in Smyrna. Why didn't he just say, What's the matter with you people? Don't you realize that you could have avoided these afflictions had you just stocked up some weapons? There is your sense. And poverty? What excuse have you for poverty? Were you not able to store up some food? Come on. 
Why did Yeshua not rebuke them for not being prepared? Maybe these poor folks in Smyrna would have had it a little better had they just did some prepping. Is that how the scripture goes, people? No, that's not how it goes. And what were Yeshua's words to the Philadelphians in chapter 3, verse 11? Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, that no one may take your crown. Hmm. Maybe we pre-tribulation cowards who are waiting to escape have actually got it wrong all this time. Maybe Yeshua really meant something else when he said the word crown. You know, kind of like the way the Apostle John didn't really mean everyone when he wrote that everyone on earth would hide from Yeshua in Revelation 6.15. Yeah, the mid slash post-tribulation folks, they said that when John said everyone hides from Yeshua, he really didn't mean that. I actually have that from two different proponents of those theories. Perhaps by crown, Yeshua really meant what people acquire on earth to assure their survival from Antichrist. Maybe that's what he meant. So should we consider that the mid-slash-post-tribulation folks might have it correct and read it this way? Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, that no one may take your food, or your water, or your weapons. Woe unto anyone who teaches that Yeshua would say such a thing, and woe to those who say that he did not mean every word he spoke in Matthew chapter 6, which we will look at in just a bit. And I got one more thing for you to consider that Yeshua said to his Talmudim, his disciples. What was the last thing he commanded those men before he was betrayed in the Garden of Gethsemane? He said, watch and pray, not store and hoard. <laughs> oh, my friends, to these mid-slash-post-tribulation promoters, the biggest problem they have with the pre-tribulation rapture doctrine is that there is just no money to be made from it. That, that right there should be proof of its perfect truth. Friends, those dear brothers and sisters in the Middle East who have lost their lives for the testimony of Yeshua certainly believe that Yeshua could have come for them at any moment, for they trusted Scripture. Unlike these preppers, they understood completely what Paul meant when he said this. For the kingdom of Elohim is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Ruach HaKadosh. In fact, those modern-day martyrs, those brothers and sisters who lost their lives in the Middle East over these past years, they are the modern-day fulfillment of 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 6 through 8. Read this with me. And you became followers of us and of the Adon, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Ruach HaKadosh, so that you became examples to all in Macedonia and Achaia who believe. For from you the word of the Adon has sounded forth, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place. Your faith to our Elohim has gone out so that we do not need to say anything. Oh, my goodness, friends, do you understand? Their witness has gone out into all the earth. Just just replace for a moment the specificity of Macedonia and Achaia and say that they have become examples to all nations. But consider, would they have been examples to us of their true faith had they done like these preppers and stockpiled guns with which to kill their persecutors? No. They had the eyes to see and the ears to hear that the scriptures never tell us once that the way to defeat the enemy is to store into bonds. They knew that the whole armor of Yahweh was much better protection than a pantry full of powdered potato soup and a gun. They had the sense and the discernment to see that nowhere in their writings did Peter or Paul, James, John or Yeshua himself ever tell us to stockpile food and weapons to secure our safety and our futures. But hey, 
perhaps the mid slash post tribulation folks can make use of the Mandela effect. Remember I said to leave it in your back pocket? I would uh, bring it up later? Well, later has come, regardless of what Claire said. Those who have ears will hear. Now, there's a lot of stuff about this Mandela effect all over the web. But for those of you who may not know exactly what it is, uh, let me tell you what my understanding of it is with regard to what we're talking about in this here video. It is going around that this Mandela effect is altering people's perception of what the scriptures really say. Sound familiar? Did God really say? You see? Did Yeshua really say that he would come for us before the Antichrist is revealed? Yeah, I think these folks could use this effect to their advantage and profit even more from selling their survival stuff. Friends, this Mandela effect has actually got people questioning the sanctity of the Bible. People who have been believers all their lives now questioning its validity because of this theory that we all perceive things from our own realities. The Mandela effect is becoming the absolute fulfillment of many prophecies regarding the end of time as we know it. But the one that comes to my mind is this one. Amos chapter 8 verses 11 and 12. Behold, the days are coming, says the Adon Yahweh, that I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of Yahweh. They shall wander from sea to sea and from north to east. They shall run to and fro, seeking the word of Yahweh, but shall not find it. Hearkens us back somewhat to Isaiah 55, 6, does it not? People, when the Ruach HaKadosh is taken out of the way, along with the bride of Yeshua, the word of Elohim will vanish just like the light of the stars in the Shamaim. This Mandela effect is a foreshadow in that it is prepping people, that's right, prepping people to see the living word of Elohim as fallible, and thus it will be rendered useless when the time of Jacob's trouble begins. Now do not get me wrong, I am not saying that the word of Elohim will be useless. It will be that the world has perceived it as useless. Now of course, when we are gone, there will be those who will be doing the weeping and the gnashing of teeth, realizing what they have missed. But that shouldn't be though, should it? Because Amos tells us that, that there will not be a famine of food. The mid-slash-post-tribulation preppers have actually fulfilled that prophecy themselves. They'll have plenty of food and drink. So why do they need the word? Their bonds have saved them, right? Wrong. Very, very wrong. Only the blood of Yeshua HaMashiach can save, my friends. And only his word can bring peace to a troubled mind and a broken heart. Brothers and sisters, listen. Listen to Paul, the Apostle Paul, when he says, and do this knowing the time. Do you see, my friends, the Apostle Paul and, and all the early church, they knew that, that the rapture was imminent. And do this knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Therefore let us cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. But Laban, aren't we already saved? Did Yeshua not save us at his death? Of course he did. But Paul in this passage is clearly speaking about the salvation of our physical bodies at the rapture, which will occur before the time of Jacob's trouble. That is what, that is what this prophecy alert is all about, my friends. It's about laying off all these tabloid prophets and not believing the lie that we, the bride of Yeshua, will be here during the time of Jacob's trouble. 
Yeshua said, it is finished from that cruel tree. He did not say it is finished until the time of Jacob's trouble, and then I have to turn you back over to Satan again. Oh, that is blasphemous to even think such a thought. So please, don't fall into the belief system of these mid- and post-tribulation promoters, my friends. <laughs> please, read your scriptures. Read them from beginning to end. You will see so many foreshadows of the, the rapture, the netkatap, the hapatso in the old covenant, and definitely in the writings of the Apostle Paul. Do not let them tell you that Yeshua is speaking of the rapture. In Matthew chapter 24, no such thing. He is speaking to Jacob, not to his bride. Please get down on your knees and pray Jeremiah 33 3 and ask him to show you and to give you clear guidance and prove to you that the pre-tribulation catching away of Yeshua's bride before the time of Jacob's trouble is perfect truth. If you are one who is struggling with the idea of being raptured out of here before the tribulation, if you just can't seem to get your mind around it, if it seems to make more sense to you that Yeshua would leave you here for the most horrific time in all of history, then, then read Jeremiah 33, 3 with me right now, and then we are going to pray about this. From the book of Jeremiah, Yermeyahu, chapter 33, verse 3. Call to me, and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. Oh, my friends, if there are any of you out there who sincerely wish to understand the truth of the rapture doctrine, fall on your knees and say, Say, Father, pray this with me now, pray it with me now. Oh, Father, Father in the Shamaim, Abba, Father. I am so confused ab about the doctrine of the rapture. One is saying this, one is saying that. There is arguing, there is vitriol, there is malice amongst brethren over this doctrine. Please, please show me in your word, not by any man. Show me in your word. As it says in the book of Jeremiah, it says that if I call on you, you'll answer and show me things which I do not know. Well, this rapture doctrine has got me confused. So please show me the truth. In Yeshua's name, amen. I hope you prayed that prayer if you are confused about rapture doctrine. And I know that our Abba, our Father in the Shamaim is going to show you without a shadow of a doubt that his bane, his son Yeshua, our bridegroom, will come for us before the time of Jacob's trouble. Amen and Maranatha. Keep that verse of scripture in your minds at all times, my friends, that Jeremiah 33, 3. And please also, the one we just saw in Romans 13, for it is high time to awake out of sleep. Put away watching these tabloid prophets and, and listening to those who are trying to profit from selling survival gear. It only causes division and confusion, especially among sheep who still may be little lambs in their faith. These, these people, they use tactics of the world to draw you into vain ramblings. And I believe the Apostle Paul struck home again. He addresses this perfectly, succinctly, in the book of Colossians. Chapter 2, verse 8. Let us read this. Beware. Lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Mashiach. And look how he prefaces this in verse 4 of the same. Now this I say, lest anyone should deceive you with persuasive words. <laughs> Do you see? Do you see what the Apostle Paul is saying here? He is telling you exactly what I've been saying throughout this whole video. Do not allow these air ticklers to draw you in with persuasive words, trying to get you to believe that a piece of hyped-up sensationalized trivia is a sign from Elohim. And to beware of the book and DVD sellers who do nothing more than to get you to put your scriptures up on the shelf 
and sit in front of a screen. The prophet Amos warned us. He warned us that there will be a famine of the word. But rest assured, <laughs> there's going to be plenty of those DVDs lying around. So, for those of you who plan to be here during the time of Jacob's trouble, you'd better put those DVDs up on the shelf and read your scriptures while you still can. And do not be deceived by this Mandela effect. It is of the world, an earthly trick. Yeshua told us, he assured us in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, verse 18. For assuredly I say to you, till the Shamaim and the earth pass away, von jot or von tittle will by no means pass from the Torah till all is fulfilled. So do not even dare question the perfect truth of the word of Elohim. For the sake of where you will spend eternity, do not even dare. Oh, Leb, what are you getting at with all this? Friends, the crux of this biscuit is everything I've been saying. I'm just trying to tell you to put away the trivial lunacy of the tabloid prophets. But if you do decide to venture into their lair, please, before you read or watch anything, follow the advice of Yohanan, the Apostle John, when he said this in his first letter, 1 John chapter 4, verse 1, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they be of Elohim, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. That's your bottom dollar on that. I just put that in there. <laughs> you will not find that in any translation. <laughs> Friends, if your spirit is longing for peace, the peace that surpasses all understanding, you must, you must stop clinging to the world, even to any small part of it. Now, I know that most of you who watch my videos, you have let go. Oh, you don't want any part of this world any longer. But there are some of you who are holding on to something. Perhaps it is a, a loved one, a family member, a dear friend who has not yet been saved. And you are, you are worried about that. And you don't want to let go of them. Perhaps... Perhaps Elohim has blessed you with a career that you love. You love your work. You love your job. I know, I know that it can be difficult to let go of these things. But there is a way. And the way to do it is to stay in the living word of Elohim. Stay in those scriptures. Put the DVDs away and pick up that Bible and cling to that. That you can hold on to <laughs> until our bridegroom comes for us. The more you stay in the word, the more you will see that it is as the hymn says, the things of earth will grow strangely dim. The words of scripture will fill your soul and you will long to leave this world. You will be able to let go of the things that you think that you cannot let go of now. Put your trust solely in him and he will help you to let go. I guarantee it. And here's a scripture that you can start with. This one right here, once again from the Apostle Paul. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. And if anyone, I don't care who it is, if anyone says to you, you are so heavenly minded that you are no earthly good. If anyone says that to you, you look them straight in their evil eye and you say, get thee behind me. Satan. And now, my friends, I want to close by doing what I believe is the most important thing we can do for one another, and that is to comfort and edify through the living word of the Almighty of hosts. I'm going to read the entirety of Matthew chapter 6. 
I know that it will comfort all those who look up and await his coming in the clouds before all the things that Yeshua taught are coming do come. And I pray that it will edify those who mock that sound doctrine. Nothing our Savior spoke in this chapter is a suggestion, my friends. And those who do not take it literally, well, please, please read it carefully before you start building that barn. And for those of you who may have already built your barn and have stocked it up with plenty of food and, and water and things that people may be in need of, remember, they're in need of them right now. If you've stocked up a barn, help people now. Amen and Maranatha. And now, from the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 6. The verge of our Savior, Yeshua HaMashiach, the Lamb of Yahweh, who takes away the sin of the world. Read along with me, my friends. Take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men, to be seen by them. Otherwise, you have no reward from your father in the Shamaim. Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory from men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. Verse 3. But when you do a charitable deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, that your charitable deed may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will himself reward you openly. And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. Verse 6. But you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Verse 8, Therefore, do not be like them, for your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask Him. In this manner, therefore, pray, Our Father, in the Shamaim, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in the Shamaim. Give us this day, our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Verse 14. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your father and the Shamaim will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Moreover, when you fast, do not be like the hypocrites for the sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces, that they may appear to men to be fasting. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. Verse 17. But you, when you fast, Anoint your head and wash your face, so that you do not appear to men to be fasting, but to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, in the Shamaim, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. Verse 21, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. 
The length of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness. Verse 24, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve Elohim and Mammon. Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into bonds. Yet your father in the Shamayim feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Verse 27 Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if Elohim so clothes the grass of the field which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of a little faith? Verse 31. Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your father in the Shamaim knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of Elohim and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow. But tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble.